Welcome to another exciting episode of the Fresh Cred Podcast, where we bring you the freshest insights from the leaders shaping the future of the food industry. Today, we're thrilled to have Chef David Ruiz, an award-winning chef known for his innovative approach to fresh produce and culinary excellence. Chef David shares his passion for crafting unique dishes that celebrate fresh ingredients and his insights into the trends driving the culinary world today. Now, let's get cooking with Chef David Ruiz. Welcome, folks. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we're here at IFPA's The Food Service Conference in beautiful Monterey, California. I'm joined here by my co-host, Mr. Craig Slate. Hey, y'all. And we've also been joined by executive chef, Mr. David Reese. Bueno. Thank you for joining us. So, executive chef of Scalo. Exactly. In Albuquerque, New Mexico. Yes. Thanks for being here. I'm very excited to be here. So we were talking a little bit before we started recording. Your first time at the expo, at this expo? It is. It okay. Is. So what do, you, what do you think so far? It's incredible. Um, I love Monterey. Mm. I actually grew up in San Jose. Um, oh, wow. So I spent a lot of my youth like down here, like actually out there surfing. I used to surf up in Santa Cruz too. So uh, weather is extremely hot out here. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it here. is a little weird. So I grew up in Gilroy. Um, I live in Texas. My family's from Texas. I moved out here. And then moved back, and so I live in Texas now. But yeah, I I was actually born in San Jose, um, so yeah, I know the area pretty well too. And it's it's funny because I was talking about it this week, and I said, you know, I wish, you know, it's all everything's perspective, right? Like I wish I would have appreciated it more growing up here. I look back, and it feels like something out of a movie, like my childhood. And exactly. You know, we we lived in the foothills, like near the foothills there in Gilroy, so out in the country, and it was just a great place. It was a great time to be a kid too. You know, in the eighties and. Um, it's, I wish I appreciated the weather more. Exactly. Um, it seems like everywhere I've lived since has been super hot. Las Vegas, Houston, South Texas, Phoenix. I mean, all hot places. So I don't know. I'm ready to move to Alaska or something <laughs> like that. But um, so you were, you said you grew up here. Yeah. And then where'd you, where'd you go? How'd you get to, how'd you get to Albuquerque? Yeah. So um, I was working actually out in Yosemite, California about 12 years ago. Beautiful place. Um, I got drunk one night and mm -hmm. I threw, I wanted to move and I threw a, a dart on a map of the US and I said, I'm gonna to move to wherever wherever this no dart way. is. And if it hits a small city, I'll move to the next biggest city. Well, it hit Las Lunas, which is about 30 miles south of uh, yeah. Albuquerque. And I started looking for jobs in Albuquerque. And I actually, my first job was at the Hyatt Tamiya there. Huh. Um, I moved out in 2013, didn't know a single soul. Oh. Um, thought I'd be there for a year or two and it's been 11 years now. That's awesome. My wife uh, has an aunt that lives in Las Lunas. Um, and I haven't been there, but I've been to Albuquerque a bunch of times. Um, great part. I mean, New Mexico is beautiful. Um, I wish I had more time to explore it, but, yeah. um, New Mexico, Colorado, it's kind of a toss up for me, but, um, could see myself living there maybe in the future. Exactly. It's a gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous place. Or at least have some sort of arrangement where at least I could spend the summers there because they're a little less, um, severe oh, than, yeah. than Texas. Um, so Scalo. Tell us about the restaurant. Um, what kind of cuisine do you yeah. serve there? Um, yeah, a little bit about that would be great. So uh, Scalo opened up in 1986. It was one of the flagship restaurants in Albuquerque in a region called Knob Hill. Uh, Knob Hill was actually named after the Knob Hill in San Francisco, ironically. Oh, wow. uh, so there was a lady who settled in like the 20s from the original Knob Hill in San Francisco in there and kind of renamed that area. Um, Knob Hill is known for its great restaurants, uh, and my restaurant was the crown jewel there for a very long time. Um, it closed down in 2018 after a great run. Um, it was kind of, kind of ran into the ground. There was some some, some bad some bad management and uh, pipe burst one night in 2018, and the restaurant shut down. It was rebought by a couple in uh, late 2019. Uh, reopened, of course, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Great I, timing. Exactly. <laughs> um, I got hired about three years ago to kind of like just renovate the place, to okay. kind of bring it back to its former glory. I will tell you guys, I had always wanted to be the chef of this restaurant. Wow. Um, so it, it reminded me of a restaurant. I worked here in the Bay Area, so it's a completely open kitchen. Uh, we, all, we do Italian food, so every day I make fresh pasta there. Uh, we source from about 17 different farms. We have So we have a beautiful co-op of... of vegetable farmers, beef, pork farmers as well. Um, and what we're really doing is it, it's Italian, but it's 
it's farm to table and it has like a New Mexican, we're sourcing from New Mexico, if that makes sense. Sure. And we do fuse like some of the red and green chili. We fuse some of the Native American concepts like blue corn, mm. uh, sumac, agave, and all that type of stuff into our food. That's awesome. Wow. So I love the trajectory, right? So mm -hmm. I take it you're not a risk taker. I mean, anybody that just throws a dart at a dart <laughs> That's board. something yeah. out of a movie. Yeah, that I, seems I, like something I, so, out of a movie. So, yeah, I, I'm going to assume that maybe you've, you've, you've taken a few risks in your life. Is that fair to say? It is. I mean, no risk, no reward. Uh, I think in my older age, though, I'm a little bit more... Uh, <laughs> Do a little diverse. more research behind my risks yeah. now. Yeah. So. You're not throwing dartboards for the next move no, just yet? No, <laughs> yeah, so, or, or maybe not getting as, as drunk and then throwing dartboards. Exactly. that becoming your planning mechanism? Well, with that risk-taking, I mean, I'm curious, do you, do you take to, now do you take that risk uh, attitude that you have and, and apply that to kind of what you're cooking and, and how you're seeing the, your next menu item or what you're doing in the kitchen? We do. So we're, we're very technique driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always say like everything's already been done under the sun. It's just kind of how you look at it. You know, my big thing is like, what's my point of view? You know, I think in order for a restaurant to be successful, the head chef, the executive chef has to have like, what's his story behind the food. Um, so I've, you know, for example, we're doing things like dry aging fish in the restaurant, right? Mm. We've even actually started a program where we were dry aging vegetables. That was like the big thing. Um, talk, I, I, I gotta right. study a dry aging fish, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, I, I guess I, to some extent, understand even the concept around dry aged beef, you mm -hmm. know? To, there's also a part of me that thinks it's, you know, it's a good marketing strategy, you know, because I've had a, again, I've had good dry aged beef. Tell me what it changes about the fish. How does dry aging fish, what changes and exactly. what, what improves it? So first of all, I have to give credit to a guy named Josh Nyland. He's a chef in Australia and he's the the original, the original founder of, of this concept. Um, so what it does is it prolongs the, the fish's life, but not only does that, it concentrates the flavor, uh, creates a different texture and a, an overall a completely different product. Um, one that tastes like meatier and a lot, in my opinion, more flavor and juicier. So it takes so basically what dry aging does is it takes the, the the water basically out of it right it reduces the amount of water. How would you, how do you go about dry aging fish? Okay, so we I built a chamber in the restaurant, so it's um, we actually took an empty closet that we weren't using, um, and I was like, okay, what you know what can we do with this? You know, as space is always the ever problem in every especially mm -hmm. single standing restaurant. So we have it sitting at a certain temperature and a, a certain humidity. And then what I do is I just crust it in a, like sea salt. Okay. Um, and we have, depending on what fish it is, it'll sit for anywhere from 10 to 14 to 21 days. So that preserves and draws the moisture. Exactly. And you'll see like you'll lose about 25%. You know, for example, we do halibut and we lose about 25% of it. But then you get this like just beautiful, like if you can think about halibut on steroids, like as a flavor. Um, and it's just incredible. Wow. So yeah, with that process, no, no. So it, the, the, it doesn't get old or doesn't mold or anything exactly. like that. Then the salt is that what does the protective on it? Yeah. So the salt, the salt cures it, and then you know we have a we have a fan in there that um, kind of helps keeping it dry because what you really want to do is just keep moisture, yeah, like off the fish. You know, we we also have a dry aging beef program there. Same thing, hmm. um, two two separate areas that we do it in. But uh, you're just trying to keep that moisture off. And the vegetables, how did that work? The first time, actually the first few times we did it was an epic failure. Um, but you know, fail, 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 guys, is my big thing. Um, and when you do take some of these risks, um, you know, you gotta put yourself out there. Uh, we have a lot of vegetarians and vegans that come into our restaurant and we're starting to, you know, with the climate changing, um, with the space of our restaurant, you know, we're trying to use some different techniques, like I said, technique driven. So. You know, we, we started off with an eggplant. It was off, it was horrible, uh, but we're now we have a seven day dry aged eggplant that we actually uh, we salt, we cure it, then it gets uh, dry aged for seven days. We smoke it and then we grill it, and it's absolutely. Oh my fantastic. god! I gotta so, try that. That's it is, it's, it's, it's 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 kind of like mind blowing, and uh, you know what? I, and I had this conversation on the, my panel yesterday, and it's like most people are like, you know, why do you do that, chef, or why would you do that? And in my opinion, it's like, why wouldn't we do that? Right. So, so often we've been told by, you know, you know, the old, I always say like the old European chefs, like what we could and what we couldn't do. 
I think at this point, you know, we're just kind of throwing the playbook out and, and kind of starting over. The gloves are off. Why? Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, when you said, you know, everything's already been done or, or you know, it's, it's, it's just done differently. I don't know. I don't know of anybody that's doing dry-aged eggplant, smoking it, and then grilling it. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, so we, we're a fairly sizable eggplant shipper. In fact, okay. when I come to see you, I'm going to bring you my own case of eggs that you can uh, okay. that, that you can smoke up. But seriously, that sounds amazing. It's fun. It's just, you know, my staff, we test, use it as a test kitchen a lot. So we're, we're just playing with a lot of, you know, different unique products. And we're very vegetable driven as an Italian restaurant, you know. And so we, we have a lot of local farmers, but we use some of the big guys too and you know, we're just kind of fit fit all that product in there and what we can do with it. Yeah, because I was going to ask. I mean, some of the some of the items are very seasonal. I mean, green and red chilies, New Mexico chilies are obviously there's a season and it's not, you know, access. You just don't have it year round, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you work around that? I mean, do you store enough? Do you freeze? I mean, do you offer it year round? Yeah. Or? So so the green chili for sure. So. Um, once again, so our, our growing season for local is probably like mid to late April through, if you're lucky, like mid October. So what we're doing in those like spring, summer, and like late or early fall months is we're trying to, we're using every technique, preserving, canning, uh, we'll sous vide and freeze uh, all these products so that we have them to use them throughout the winter. Mm-hmm. Because in the winter time, we're not really able to get very much. Uh, but we, you know, we moved to a heavier seasonal menu at that point. Um, and then we, we do use a frozen green chili product during that time. Unfortunately, it's mm-hmm. frozen, but it's still pretty great. Yeah, green chili's good. Yeah, no, we were, we were talking about that before the show, about the roasters and uh, the smell of the roasters uh, when you roll up at your grocery store and, uh, and go to pick up the stuff. It's a lot of work, though. I think the it last is. time I, bo- <laughs> I, I picked up a box, I thought I'd be a hero, and I came home and I showed my wife, and she's like, you know what we have to do with it now, right? We have to process it all, because they were roasted and they were sweating. Yeah. And then you have to do something with them, right? And so, yeah, we spent the rest of that evening cutting and peeling and <laughs> putting everything in bags. Wasn't and such so a great idea. It wasn't such a great idea. And I'd just come off a trip, so I showed up at home with a case of roasted green chilies, and I didn't really think that through. Yeah, you probably shouldn't start with a case. <laughs> they yeah. do have smaller packs. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, well, that's just, just a little... It seemed little, very attractive. A little know. tip, but... Uh, so I love that. That, that was kind of where I was going mm-hmm. with that question around the risk, and I mean, that's fantastic i mean what else i mean so so far you've piqued my interest i mean we've got the dried aged veg i love the eggplant idea fish you yeah. know i want to i want to try this halibut i mean that sounds amazing Have you smoked artichokes oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean I, we're we're big we're big like i said it's all technique driven we're, we're big into like just infusing whatever kind of our imaginations are i'm very lucky i have a great staff uh they're very diverse so i my i have a prep guy who's a former executive chef his kids are grown okay. he grew up in las cruces but he's it's like having a second executive chef like on your staff and he he helps a lot he does a lot of the uh the smoking and the grilling mm-hmm. and those types of things um and then you know most of my staff to be honest guys they started off with me as dishwashers my sous chef uh my lead line cook um really and they they all have different they all have like different backgrounds and you know one of my big things is we're creating menus too is to be like well what did you love that your grandmother cooked Mm. you know how can we recreate that and fit that in this restaurant and it kind of gives them but staying it on the in the italian vein or do you branch out how how that before i knew you you were an italian restaurant primarily yeah I was dreaming about pozole because that's okay. green so, chili pozole is my favorite. So I'll, so I'll give you, I love green chili pozole. But, okay, for example, you know, one of one of my, his favorite thing was mole. So uh-huh. we started, we ended up creating this beautiful uh, corn ravioli that sits on a mole sauce with candy pinions and uh, mm, pinions. Queso, fresco, queso fresco. Mm. Oh, yeah. That sounds great. Mole. I think I had it once a week my whole life growing up, so I said I'd never eat it again, but I'll try you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So as you can see, we're using these like diverse you know, methods. Again, um, you know, we have a huge Native American influence. Right. Uh, so instead of doing normal focaccia, we use blue corn is very popular there. We do a blue corn focaccia. You know? mm. So it's, like, it's, the, it's just taking the same old thing, guys, and reimagining it with the ingredients that we have there. 
So awesome. cur- curious in the in the way the world's moving and the consumers you know, out there, right? So you talked about vegans and vegetarians mm-hmm. kind of being a, a big thing, and that's why you're kind of leaning into that veg space even more than you were yeah. possibly. What about things like you're you got to have a lot of pasta? Yeah. You guys have the alternative gluten free, or are you strictly straight up old school pasta? No. So I we make a gluten free pasta with Thomas Keller's Cup for Cup. Okay. Um, we do it in a separate part of our kitchen, but yeah, we you know we try to be inclusive of of everybody as much as we can. Yeah, you know, obviously there's a point where you got to say no, but um, we do offer like vegan, vegetarian, and gluten free dishes all over the menu, including a gluten free pasta. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. What do you think about the cauliflower trend with like pizza crusts and cauliflower? bowls and meat i mean that's all value added like some consumer it, products but some of it i'm here for i love me a good cauliflower crust i in general I like it too. I, in general i love cauliflower yeah. um some of it's starting to get a little bit beyond like you know <laughs> over the top <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. everything cauliflower yeah. but um i think there's a lot of versatility in vegetables that just isn't isn't really recognized yeah you know it's fun i mean i haven't gone through the process of actually making a fresh like homemade cauliflower crust but we buy the the blanks i call them basically it's just a yeah. crust by itself and the kids love like oh, yeah. building their own pizza and i'm a big like well done i like my pizza very well done like crispy and um yeah i think once it gets to that point i mean i i, I tell myself i can't really tell the difference i don't know i guess you can i can't i really can't uh, once it's yeah. you know cr- crispy enough i mean it's it's just great i mean yeah. it's all about what you put on it i'll tell you uh, and it's better than having a pizza that's semi cold by the time you get it yeah, home. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, and that's what I hate about. I'll you, tell you, a good almost burnt bottom is the way I love my pizza. Really? Yeah. Mhm. Now do you guys do pizzas there? We do pizza in the restaurant as well. Yeah. We, we have a we make a gluten-free uh pizza dough. It's it's something that we are ever expanding with. It's hard to get that like crisp bottom with it mm-hmm. to kind of get it that same that same texture, but we do a pretty good job and it's like I said it's something that we just continue to evolve like month after month. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you guys, is it is the stone the stone grill? Or how, how are you doing your pizza? Yeah, so big, we use a big stone pizza uh, oven. oven. Yeah. Uh, we we actually it's it's for it's meant for uh, it's both electrical, but it does wood as well. Uh-huh. So mm-hmm. we'll throw we'll throw some uh, pecan wood in there as well, just trying to get that like flavor. Um, and then we'll, we have to actually cook the uh, the gluten free pizzas like on a separate like a separate little stone that we keep inside of there just to try to keep it gluten you know to keep yeah to keep the regular pizza no i love that pizza. like i say my wife will she will be joining me and she'll be glad to know because she loves italian food he's not gonna leave, he's not gonna leave you alone now no oh there. no i mean i'm coming he's got he's <laughs> yeah got, i want to go the too. bad news for him well you can come it's a bit more of a drive for you than yeah, it is well. me and so uh but um yeah so because yeah she she can't get typically good italian food because she's got to avoid gluten and all that kind of got stuff it. so so for her I, I was asking on her behalf because i want to go home and get excited about your restaurant and i was like yeah you can't go so oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey but all right did you so did you as a young child you're did you looking around it's like you know what i'm gonna grow up to be a chef is that kind of you know before the dart the dart was yeah, thrown yeah. is it when did you um, when did the chef epiphany come pretty early i'd say about eight um well i so Funny enough, I have a, a white Jewish mother, a Mexican Catholic father. Um, so I had these like two, you know, crazy religions and, and food influences in my life. My grandmother, right? So she, it's funny you say that. So my grandmother has a small farm in Gilroy, California, oh, right, right there off Third Street. Um, and so she spent about a decade in France and she was from Mexico. So I grew up eating this crazy Mexican, like French fusion. French Mexican. Feud. Oh my gosh. That's um, maybe and I was like one of those kids where like our parents weren't, we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. Um, and so my mom was shopping at farmers markets at a young age. Um, I, I have a twin sister. We knew what food was. We knew what good food was, especially mm-hmm. growing up in the Bay area. Um, and I spent all my summers with my grandmother. She had avocado trees. She grew livestock. Um, so I saw that farm to table movement from a very young age. So at eight years old, I'm reading Betty Crocker cookbooks. I'm hanging out in front of restaurants, watching what bakers and, and, and pizza, uh, pizza chefs are doing. Uh, and by about 10 years old, it was like, hey, this is the path that I want to be on. I was accepted to culinary school my junior year. And um, a month after graduating high school, I was already I was already doing it. My first job was at an In-N-Out Burger. Um, and so food has always just been a huge part of my life and to be honest boys it's the only thing i was ever good at yeah well you're very fortunate to to realize that at such a young age i mean not everybody does 
um, you know, a big part of our podcast when we started it, we were sort of on a health kick and trying to improve ourselves and our lives and our health. And so you seem to be a pretty fit guy. You work in a restaurant. <laughs> like, how do you do it? How, what, you have any kind of routine that you yeah. regularly go to the gym or I mean I, if I was a chef I would weigh 500 pounds <laughs> so um, yeah so 2016 uh, I I was on chopped okay I was in New York I got home it was the fattest I ever was I weighed 240 pounds in, wow. in the summer of 2016 took a look at myself in the mirror I had a uh, my son was about a year and a half at that point and I couldn't keep up playing with him mm -hmm. and I was like there's just got to be a change um, so it wasn't natural for you. Like you had to work at yeah, it. Yeah, I did. Because so some people are just naturally, you know, their metabolism is such that they just don't gain a lot of and weight. We hate those people. Yeah, <laughs> um, so anyway, I, you know, from then, you know, I, I started a pretty good workout program during the pandemic. I became a runner. Mm -hmm. um, I was running, you know, a 10K, like pretty much, you know, five times a week. Uh, luckily, now I have a I have a beautiful partner. Her name's Paige, and she's she's everything she does is like health related. She's a, a road cyclist. Mm. Um, so the last like two and a half years, I've gotten into that. Um, so we bike, you know, we'll bike 30, 40 miles, you know, about three or four times a week, and then I I'm in the gym five five days a week, you know, Monday wow. through Friday in the morning. So I gotta if I don't, I'll blow up, you know. Wow. Man. It's pretty impressive. And so when do you at the kitchen and then when do you sleep? <laughs> I don't. I don't. You know, I grind. I grind about 70 hours a week in my restaurant. Um, I always say, though, it's like I love what I do. Yeah. I'm very lucky. The crew that I have, too. I mean, they are everybody's highly invested in what we're doing. So yeah. lucky. Yeah. No, that's that's uh, fortunate. I always tell my kids, I mean, find what you love and do that. Yeah. You know, see if you can make some money. off. Well, yeah. Right? I mean, you, you typically Preferably. you can figure <laughs> you can figure out how to make money out of just about anything. Right. But uh, but it's awesome when you're at a young age and you figure out what you want to do mm -hmm. and, and then you just drive into that passion. And so, yeah. So you you know eventually when you went to albuquerque mm -hmm. you were already a chef then when you got to albuquerque is that correct so yeah so i was i, I was originally hired at the hyatt tamia and i was their garbage chef so all cold food so basically salads fruit platters like all that stuff um after so i worked there for two years um and then i took my first executive chef place or executive chef position at a restaurant called soul and vine that i helped open uh, and I will tell you guys, I will look back at the food that I put out in 2014, 15, and I'm embarrassed by like, what I put out. So. Yeah. But, it's, uh, but it was a really good experience uh, making that transition from a sous chef into that executive chef role. But I've been one ever since. Is there anything in your years of being around chefs, um, yourself, is there anything in particular that stands out that, that really makes an exceptional chef? it's to be it's to be open um you have to make an uh, i always say you have to make an enemy of envy um and you have to really humble yourself i mean it's it's one of those things where you can learn from anybody um support the people around you in your community that's like another big thing but uh i failed and lost way more than i've won in this world um and i try to tell people like y y don't be afraid to make a mistake because we learn from we learn a whole lot more from our failures and our successes. Yeah, hmm. yeah. There's there's no doubt about that. We've talked about that, uh, you know, in, in previous podcasts, and it's a hard thing, you know. I mean, I think that's a, it's people think that's just a slogan, but the reality of it is, it's real. Mm -hmm. You know, all your education comes not from what you succeed at, but what you fail at. It is, and I think the problem is that we live in a, a world sometimes that still says don't fail. Yeah, right? we we live in that, in and it's not true, uh, yeah. not at all. E, e, Thomas Keller, Rene Zendepi, all these very well known chefs will all tell you more about the times that they lost and the times that the dish didn't work out than the one that did. Yeah, you know? can you go back to your experience on Chopped? That, oh, that, that was really interesting. Like I watched the show. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm lucky. So I was on Chopped in 2016. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. So. Um, you know, I was the executive chef of the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center at the time. Um, they flew me out to New York. I was out there for a week. I uh, filmed the third day. It was the absolute worst cooking performance I've ever put on <laughs> tape ever. I was so... What I were your ingredients? Oh, so I, mean, I was, well, hang on. Uh, yeah. I want to hear about... So, so yeah, go I was so nervous. Yeah, guys. nervous. That, that was the big thing, right? I'm, I'm, I was like... I didn't sleep the night before. I was, I was just like... 
I was so amped up, you know, and I was just like, I, I, I can't lose. I can't lose. I can't be embarrassed. Like, this is going to be embarrassing if I get chopped first. And I put too much stress and pressure on myself. So they get you up at 6 a.m., you know, and, and you're at, you know, you meet where, where you go at the Bowery Market at 7. They take you up and, you know, they strip you of everything and give you a chef coat and, you know, they put you out on this stage and it's, you know, they have, they have a million lights and everything. And so you're sweating, you're hungry, you're nervous. Um, and I'm not going to lie. I let all that get to me. The stage was too big at that point in my career for me at that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a taco episode. It's called taco time. Uh, so you can go back and look at it. Uh, the first, the first course they gave us tripe, Mm. coffee liqueur, broccoli rob. Oh my God. Um, and, uh, watermelon. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, I'm sitting there like, the hell am I gonna do with oh this? My God. And you had to make a taco. And so every, every, so I was, I was very lucky. The only reason I didn't get chopped on the very first, um, very first set there was because unfortunately the poor girl next to me forgot to put the tripe, which was one of the core ingredients on her wow. dish. The, I got chopped the second, on the second wow. round. Um, I went home really defeated. I was, I was pretty heartbroken and, uh, just knew I had a lot more to do to learn to push myself. Anyway, what was the required dish on the second round? So same thing, taco. Um, I'm trying to remember this time around. It was, it was like pork shoulder too. Mm -hmm. It was like pork shoulder. It was like um, yeah. Vidalia onions mm -hmm. and a couple other things. I can't even remember now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna watch. This well, I'm just curious. How, so overall. Right. So, and you know, it's as you tell that story. So, all I'm reflecting back on is two minutes before yeah. we were talking about failure and being the best way to learn, yeah. you know, and you know, how much you got out of it. But I'm curious, how did the dishes taste? Right. So, I guess, you know, from the different chefs, you know, when you tasted it, did you get a chance to taste everybody's? So, mine was the worst. It was. It was. So I was. I was really deep in my career with. So if most people know me, my plating is is my is a big thing. My presentation of my food. Okay. It looked great. It looked better than everybody else's. But there was just nothing. There's no soul behind it. I was. I was just mm -hmm. plating for, for the judges to like it. Yeah. Um, and that was a big learning moment in my career. Now, real quick, fast forward, 2022. I get. I get asked to come back on a new show called It's Complicated. Okay. Right? Same sort of deal, but it's for it's vegan and vegetarian and mm. gluten free food this time around. Um, Tabitha Brown ran the show. Same sort of scenario. I got a good night's sleep. <laughs> I woke up. I ran a 10k that morning. Mm. Um, you know, had my coffee, shaved, got ready. I went in there and I won. Oh, that's great. I won. I won, I won the 10 grand. You know, same thing. Three. It was three. Uh, you know, three different challenges. And I'll tell you, just that. Being myself, getting that good routine, drinking water, taking, you know, having a good, good, good night's sleep was all the difference in the world. And if I could tell that David to that David, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, but that's, I got it, but that brings it complete circle, it does. right? You know, when you yeah. think about it, you know, that success that you had in 2022 was all based on what you learned in that first and competition. And you had to fail. You had to fail you that had, first you, time to get you there. You couldn't tell you that, know? David, that because no. that David had to learn that on the, on the first time. You don't know what you don't know, you know? And that's, mm -hmm. that, that's amazing. And hell, that was a nice uh, little uh, package deal, you know? Exactly. Like, so, no, that's great. That's awesome. So, all right. So, just real quick on this fresh produce. Right, and your meal preparation and kind of where yeah. you're going with fresh produce, right? Um, how do you see that with your consumers, with the folks coming into the restaurant, yeah. right? Are they really looking for you to lean more into that? Are you guys leaning more into that? And, and if so, where are you kind of going with that? Yeah, well, first off, I'll start off that the consumer is no longer dumb, uh, in my opinion. I mean, people want to know where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge, huge thing. Not only that, they now want to know what the story is behind it because they can go down to the restaurant two blocks down who's going to give you that beautiful story mm -hmm. with a James Beard nominated chef, right? And so it's not even so much like the competition. It's just, it's, it's kind of how you interpret it. Um, our clientele, as we, as we have seen, have gotten a little bit younger. Mm. And again, they're a lot more health conscious. Like this, you know, my generation of the millennials, now the Gen Z, the Gen Ys, you know, they're coming in, they're in the workforce, they have the disposable income. 
and they want healthier options. I and mean, with healthier options come more vegetables. Um, and so what we're doing, like I said, is we've really upped our game in the last couple of years with the amount of like people, like local artisans that we're buying from. You know, I shop at our downtown growers market, you know, every Saturday. So people can see that I have a presence down there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're able to tell those stories from Silverleaf, from Vita Verde Farm, from Sweet Mercy Farms. You know, you can tell these stories that like, hey, this is grown less than 50 miles from here. Mm. And we're putting, we're, we're imagining it in the way we want to cook it for you. But you're able to eat this. And not only is it beautiful, it's healthy. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, so you do, do you do feel like that folks are moving towards that you finding that people when they look at the menu they're selecting healthier options i do i see it and like i said you know that whole you know when you build a plate and you have the starch veg like protein like the classic three you know three item thing is kind of losing two in the summer like for example we're i'm i'm getting away from starches and we're doing like a double veg okay you know, for example we do this beautiful pork chop um, that we we have some braised uh, dino kale, you know the, mm -hmm. the 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 black kale essentially, and then we're we're actually taking like uh, mushrooms that are grown for uh, shiitakes for the restaurant, and we're smoking them and tossing them in a little bit of apple cider balsamic and finishing them in a pan. So it, you're you're That's losing great. that you're losing that like starch, but you're giving somebody that value. That's awesome. But it's also beautiful and it's a lot healthier. And we're we're seeing more requests for that year over year. That's awesome. So, yeah. Mm. I'm getting hungry. Yeah. So when, when I so when I and I will come, I'm coming to visit. You know, I may I may do a, a my own selfie from the restaurant. Nice. Okay. So we may set up. Um, but what what is what's what's for you, right? What's your signature on that menu? In other words, what are you going to tell me to order? Oh, that's so hard. I, oh, I, so I know. Hard. Well, I mean, it's I, like I, picking uh, your favorite kid. I know. It's um. <laughs> It's funny. People be like, what's good on the menu? It's like we design our menus that everything's great. Yeah, right? for sure. It's, it's what we're, I'm very well known for is we do um, a hand cut tagliatelle pasta um, with a truffle mushroom sauce. Okay. And we have again, we have mushrooms that are specifically grown for scallop. Um, and so we saute and we fold that in there and it gets a little bit of uh, truffle oil and then we grate some pecorino. And it sounds really simple, boys, but that's what Italian food is, and it's what we sell the most and what people just love. It. I tried taking it off the menu after two years. Three weeks later, we had so many emails and, and <laughs> wow. comments that I had to put it back on. I can't get rid of it. That's so. pretty impressive. What do you do? So, I, and so what I love to do is I like to go, especially if people have things like smoked uh, aged eggplant, yeah. right? Things are off. But for me, uh, in fact, there's a restaurant, I'm not going to remember the name of, in San Francisco. We went. It's a fabulous place. We got a recommendation on. But to go in and you have a like a chef sampler. Mm -hmm. And then it's like whatever the chef decides you're going to have. For me, that's my favorite. Because yeah. that way, all right, you don't have to pick one, but pick me five or six that you want to have try. So do you guys do anything like that? Oh, yeah. So we... The one thing about Scallo is because it's been open for so long, we have we still have a lot of like repeat customers. In fact, that's like 60% of our business. And so sometimes some of these customers will come in with like clients of theirs and they'll be like, you know what, chef, we, we, we just want you to kind of create something there for us. There you go. And then sometimes I'll just go down to the farmer's market and or I'll call a farmer like Seth from Vita Verde. I'm like, Seth, what do you got? What are you excited about? Give it to me, bring it, and we'll make something out of it. And we have um, a beautiful wine room that we can seat six, oh you God. can seat up, for, you know, four, about really did it. two, four, oh, here comes two, the four, show, two, baby. two, four, <laughs> six or eight. And I call it my chef's table. Um, and that's, that's just an incredible experience. You, you get to sit down in this beautiful wine room surrounded by about 200 bottles of wine. You can pick one of those bottles of wine. Uh, and then I come in and I bring you, you know, a little two to three bites per, per portion of something that's off menu, that's seasonal and that you you may never get again from me. Okay, well, can you adopt him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know the wheels are just spinning. Oh my God! Well, no, I mean, so I've been wanting to do this show, right, from a restaurant, right? So, because we'll go to dinner, like some of us in the produce business, or whatever, and then it's just like this organic conversation, yeah. right? Well, Mason, you know, on the production side, worries about the noise, and yeah, you know, oh, I can get the shot. And I'm like, we can figure this out. Yeah. You know he's I, here, right? I, oh, I, yeah, I, okay. I do know he's here. Yeah, and, and he'll only listen to this ten times and have to hear me say that. But 
Uh, that wine room, I mean, uh, so I love wine. So yeah. that, that's that's another passion. But wine, food, and then the opportunity. Yeah, we may be hitting you up to see if we can uh, corner yeah. that room and come uh, do it. You know, and like I say, it would be an, it, an industry deal. But we come in and just talk food, talk the industry, what's going on. Bring, over in, a, a bring in a grower. That would be cool. Yeah, we'll yeah. bring. But but yeah, and uh, something we fun we can do. So, but um, yeah. Love to be it. continued. It, it, it will have to be to continued for sure. Uh, they keep us on a pretty tight leash here so okay. uh, on the timing. But, man, this has been fantastic. And I'm glad you're in Albuquerque. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so that's that's awesome. I'm glad the DARP, you know, lost <laughs> Lunas. Uh, um, you know, what's, what's uh, God, I pass it all the time. Um, truth or consequence? Yep. T or C. Yeah. T or C. Yeah. Uh, Good news, you didn't get that one. <laughs> exactly. I stopped in there one time, about out of gas. And oh, yeah. It's like, whew. It's like a cool that. city, though. Yeah. Is it's it? a cool city. It is. I, I guess I need to go back and explore it, because yeah. I explored it at about 10 o'clock at night, you know, and it, it was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I was worried about in the name. You know, it's not really, you know, it's from a TV show. Yeah. That's how they got their name. And so, uh, anyway, that was uh, my, my experience there. But Albuquerque's great. Love Albuquerque. Love New Mexico. Well, thank you, boys. I yeah, really appreciate yeah. it. So. Yeah. So. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully, you enjoy, enjoy the rest of your time here in Monterey. I oh, am. Yeah. Kind yeah. of a semi home game for you. It is. It is. Uh, and my girlfriend and I are going to go over to the uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium tomorrow morning oh, yeah, before we get out of here. So she's excited about That's it. That's cool. So, yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for joining us. Again, to be continued because I have a feeling that <laughs> this isn't where it ends for us. It's definitely not going to end here for me. <laughs> I can tell you that. That's a wrap on today's episode with the incredible chef David Ruiz. We hope you enjoyed hearing about his culinary journey and the innovative ways he's bringing fresh produce to the forefront of modern cuisine. A big thank you to our partners, Kern Ridge Growers, Wiggins Farms, Sunfed, and IFCO. Your support makes this all possible. For more exclusive content and updates, visit us at www.thefreshcred.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you on the next episode of The Fresh Cred.